Yes, the Okinawa five minutes are, are over. So yeah, welcome everybody to the next edition of the Theoretical Sciences Visiting Program Seminar Series. And we're very pleased to have Arthur Chobanyan with us from King's College in Pennsylvania, where he's an associate professor. <clears throat> so Arthur has also done his PhD in, in Pennsylvania, more precisely at uh, the Pennsylvania State University, broadly in the field of quantum cosmology and quantum gravity. Um, then he moved on to become a lecturer at uh, American University in Washington, D.C., and then uh, later on he moved to King's College, where he's a faculty now. So, yeah, uh, his research has actually, to a large part, focused um, on conceptual and technical aspects that arise or that surround the so-called problem of time. That's a conundrum that arises when you put um, uh, quantum theory and general relativity together where time is treated very differently into the, in the two theories. And uh, the question is, how do you treat actually time in a theory of quantum gravity? Um, one of the messages to take away is um, that one should consider time as some internal degrees of freedom, um, so actually physical degrees of freedom. So it should be really, at the end of the day, measured by um, something like quantum clocks. And the challenges that arise is how do you actually treat um, such quantum clocks when they can fluctuate and be in superposition and so on and so on. And um, yeah, that's a challenging field in which Atu has been working. And I think that's also what he will tell us about. Yeah. And so the stage is yours. Um, thank you very much for uh, a, a, a brief trailer for my talk. Um, uh, I <laughs> wanna thank everyone who's involved with the TSVP. Uh, that's a great program. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come uh, here to wonderful island of Okinawa. And, uh, thank you for coming to my talk to all of you. Um, so uh, a, a little bit about me. So my my background is probably a little bit different. My, uh, a little bit different from uh, most people on campus. My home institution, uh, as a lesser known namesake of King's College in London, uh, is located in in Pennsylvania, and uh, its primary mission is actually undergraduate education. Uh, so there's about 100 faculty. So, so far it's comparable to OIST, right? Some, somewhere there. But, uh, you know, we have about 2,000 students, vast majority of whom are uh, undergraduate. There's a couple of our uh, graduate programs in, uh, in specialized fields, but everything else uh, is, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate. Our mascot is a meanish looking lion called Leo. Um, so, uh, I'm here at OIST until middle of August, uh, located in the wonderful uh, brand new building uh, of Lab 5 that I think you can see from here. Um, uh, and uh, you can find me on campus, you know, uh, gazing at the ocean views, which you can actually do from this auditorium here. It's impressive. If you share some interests with me, come stop by, find me, talk. Uh, if you want to uh, chat about anything else, um, I'll be happy to as well. Um, so if you read the title of my talk a couple of slides ago, I was saying something about uh, quantum clocks and rulers, and you may have come here under the impression that I'm about to propose um, a, a new radical way for measuring time or uh, distances using quantum systems. Uh, let me, uh, that, that's not actually what, uh, what I'm here to talk about. It's closer to what, uh, uh, Philip was saying, uh, my current focus is trying to understand how to do quantum mechanics without reference to external uh, time or space. And the idea is I, I, I go about this by using simple made up systems uh, or toy models. Uh, this is this is schematic. I'm not actually working with this particular system of geometrical figures. Uh, the idea is simple. You ha you have a total some kind of a total system that has uh, some smaller subcomponents. And uh, the hope is that you know, all of these components can be treated using quantum mechanics and then uh, some components can provide uh, references for uh, time or space relations for others, right? So maybe uh, subsystem A can serve as a clock and maybe subsystem B can serve as a special, spatial reference. And then it makes sense to talk about motion of subsystem C without referencing external uh, time or space. Now, if you read the title of my talk more uh, carefully, I, I also uh, mentioned gravity uh, there. And so what does any, any of that have to do with gravity? And uh, a chunk of my talk will be trying to convince you that, that doing this is actually useful to a longstanding uh, problem in gravity. Here's a uh, very, uh, the very, very short version 
of, of what I'm going to talk about. And, and actually this, this uh, fairly uh, famous picture is, is useful at explaining what, what, what it's all about, right? So you may have seen this if you are a physicist, you definitely have seen it. If you're not and you watched some uh, popular science TV or uh, went to a popular science talk, you may have seen this picture. What is on this image? Uh, this is a represent our representation of the cosmos, basically everything that's that's existed. So this this sideways cup is a chunk of the universe uh, that uh, and and it showcases changes over time. Each cross section of this cup is a is a slice of an instant. Uh, time goes from left to right. It increases. It starts at the Big Bang, the the, the, the beginning point of our universe, or at least hypothetically, and then it ends somewhere around our time. So this slice represents a chunk of universe as it looks today. As we, as we go back, uh, you know, here we have these, these large bright spots or galaxies. Uh, as we go back, uh, stars are more evenly dispersed. They haven't clustered yet. We go further back, we get to a point where uh, the, um, the interstellar gas hadn't collapsed yet to form stars. There's so-called dark ages. We go further back, and uh, at, at this point over here, universe was actually too hot to transmit light. It was a kind of plasma. And then uh, fun things happen here, uh, and, and you get to Big Bang, and then we, we don't really know how to go back beyond that or whether it makes sense to do so. Um, why do I bring up this picture? Is that it actually uh, uh, consists of two parts. Um, well, so... Uh, this the cup itself is uh, shows the uh, geometry of uh, um, this chunk of the universe over time uh, and how it evolves. It starts very compact, then it rapidly expands. Then the expansion sort of slows down as the cup tapers off, slows down, slows down, slows down. Then somewhere here begins to accelerate, uh, so it gets larger at a faster rate. So over here, you may have thought, well, if it goes like this, maybe it'll turn into sort of a closed sphere. But here, it definitely starts to expand some more. Right? This is uh, known as accelerated expansion. So the the uh, the cup itself is geometry, which, uh, uh, which, is, uh, our, uh, which is synonymous with our current description of gravity. And it is fundamentally described uh, by general relativity, fundamentally in the sense that this is the most basic description of uh, space-time geometry and of gravity that we have and that works. Um, the stuff inside the cup is matter, uh, right? There's, uh, there's a light, there is, oops, there's stars. Um, and uh, the most fundamental description for the stuff inside the cup is given by uh, so broadly quantum physics. So uh, uh, standard model of particle physics, quantum mechanics. Uh, I, I will kind of use uh, quantum physics to broadly encapsulate all of those things. So matter is quantum and gravity is geometrical. And uh, the two uh, descriptions, do the two fundamental descriptions of different parts of this picture don't actually work very well together. Uh, and that, that is the long-standing problem uh, about to which I'm referring, the problem of uh, quantum gravity. The union of the two, I would argue, and I think most people would agree, requires some adjustment from both. Uh, requires uh, some, a, a different way of doing quantum mechanics and uh, definitely a different way of doing gravity. And so the, the stuff that I mentioned on the previous slide, the stuff that I do, is I am actually trying to make quantum framework a bit more compatible with the way gravity works. That's kind of my uh, best, best pitch. All right, for, for the rest of the talk, I will elaborate on uh, these points uh, a little bit. Uh, so uh, the, the first uh, thing, if you're not a physicist, uh, this, this, this part might not make sense to you. Gravity equals geometry. How come uh, our theory of gravity uh, is a description of space and time geometry? Surely gravity should describe this, okay? Some, when, when, uh, how, how things fall, why they fall, and, and so on. How did it, uh, how did it come to be? Uh, how, how, how did this come to be? And so I'm going to rewind a couple of thousand years back. Um, so gravity did start off as a theory describing how things fall. Uh, there was a, a theory of gravity due to Aristotle that, 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 that got somewhat preserved. And he did try and answer questions uh, for why do some things fall down while others rise up? Um, 
he had a he had an interesting answer for that. Um, uh, well, I don't know if he had the answer or somebody else came up with, but his work includes an interesting answer. So I'm not going to necessarily attribute authorship here. I'm not a historian. Um, the answer was that um, the cosmos, his cosmos, was spherical, and a, a spherical cosmos has a well-defined center. Okay, so there's a preferred location in a spherical cosmos, the middle of it. And uh, all terrestrial objects uh, are made up of some combination of fire, air, water, earth, and they all have a proper, uh, proper place. And if you let them be, they will each sort of stratify, kind of like if you, you know, make, if you have a mixture of olive oil and water and you let it sit, that it will separate. My, I, I like to think that that's what Aristotle was, had in, in, in his mind when, when he was thinking about that. And so this does explain phenomena that, that, that you can see every day fairly well. Raindrops fall, right? Raindrops are, find themselves in air. They need to be closer to the center of the cosmos, and so they fall down. Uh, and air bubbles, for example, rise in water, while rocks, which are presumably made prim primarily of Earth, sink. Um, one thing that is missing from this description of gravity that you probably also associate with gravity is uh, motion of celestial objects, planets, uh, satellites, stars. And, and indeed, that was not part of Aristotle's description of gravity. Ancient Greeks did. Uh, track planets that, that you could see with the naked eye. There's four of them plus Earth. Uh, they, they knew that they moved in, in interesting ways, but they did not connect them to these gravitational phenomena. That happened much later. Uh, about 2,000 years later, uh, Isaac Newton was living in a different, uh, slightly different informational background uh, than Aristotle. By, by his time, uh, the heliocentric model of the cosmos was accepted, where the sun was at the center, not Earth, and so this, this, uh, per, uh, the, the gravitation, the explanation of gravity of Aristotle didn't make sense anymore. There was no, uh, the, the center of Earth was not no longer the center of the cosmos. There was no reason for heavy things to go there, uh, or at, at least that, that wasn't a reason for heavy things to go there. There was also uh, uh, already use, early use of telescopes, uh, decent uh, um, measurements of planetary motion, and not just of planets, but also of uh, some of the larger satellites of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So there's there's a lot more data, and uh, uh, the um, the the theory that uh, Newton constructed together with uh, his uh, laws of mechanics um, uh, was a theory of uh, objects uh, pulling on each other. All massive objects pull on each other. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, they basically this connected this uh, apple falling and uh, orbital motion of the moon around Earth are uh, sourced by the same force. So gravity has to do with both of those now, uh, right? Uh, really quickly, the, the actual force of gravity, right, in, in, in his uh, uh, model of it, in order to compute it, you'd need to know masses of two objects, let's say Earth and moon. You'd need to know the distance between them. Uh, and, and then you can compute the force, mass one times mass two. It gets weaker over the distance, divide by distance squared. Uh, multiply by uh, a proportionality constant, which is really, really, really small. And so gravity uh, is uh, mostly uh, noticeable when objects are really, really, really massive. And then you get the force with which Earth pulls on the moon, moon pulls on Earth. Uh, the, the model, together with uh, Newton's laws of mechanics, worked wonders. They explained all of this uh, stuff very well, predicted a bunch of new stuff. Um, and... Uh, um, the one thing that 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 really did bother Newton and contemporaries about this law was that uh, this force acted over distance, right? Uh, Earth and Moon are separated by what's mostly empty space. Uh, what is causing this uh, pull of one object on a, on the other? Uh, most other forces that Newton and contemporaries dealt with and modeled were contact forces like friction and the sort of direct push of one object on the other. This was a non-contact force. Uh, there was no good explanation for it. It did bother them, but they kind of ignored uh, the, well, didn't completely ignore the fact that this was troublesome, but lived with it because it was so successful. Um, so uh, during the next couple of centuries, so I'm getting to more recent stuff, gradually. Uh, other long distance forces have been uh, studied and modeled using what's called the field model of interaction. So by other long distance forces, I mean uh, electricity and magnetism. Uh, and the idea of a field model of interactions is that 
the objects don't uh, directly uh, push on each other or pull on each other, but that their interaction is modulated by a field. There is something for, for each interaction, there is a field that permeates all space. It has some neutral state. Uh, and uh, when there is an object that, uh, that has the appropriate charge that interacts with that field, it, it uh, bends the field, excuse me, bends the field around itself in some way. And the bumps in that field, uh, you know, pull on other bits of the field, they can propagate, right? This bit of the field pulls on that one, that one, that one, the bumps and uh, folds and wrinkles can, can propagate out. And then they can affect the motion of other objects that are interacting with that same field. So um, in the sort of most modern iteration of it, the objects themselves have actually been replaced by other kinds of fields. And so it's really one kind of field, uh, bumps in one kind of field, uh, interacting, creating bumps in another kind of field, and that field back reacting, and so on. It's a, <clears throat> uh, this, this is how we get around uh, action at a distance today, basically. Um, so uh, the, the field model was super successful in uh, uh, capturing features of electromagnetism, uh, and people were hoping that you could do the same thing for gravity. So what's the field? What's the, what's the, what are the properties of the field that, uh, you know, carries the pull of Earth on the moon, uh, you know, the sun on Earth, et cetera. Uh, and uh, due to efforts of, of, of this gentleman and, and some of his contemporaries, um, we have, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we have more or less sort of the, the, the modern, most fundamental a description of gravity the, uh, that, 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 that works that we know of, uh, a, called uh, General Theory of Relativity. Uh, this, uh, this is a statue of Einstein um, in Washington, D.C., near the National Academy of Sciences. He's holding a piece of paper. There's a bunch of equations written. One of them is E equals mc squared. Uh, the other one, I can't quite make the symbols. I think it's photoelectric effect. That's what he actually got the Nobel Prize for, I think. And then, and then it's, it's this one, Einstein uh, field equation for, uh, for, for gravity. Now, the equation is, is technical. It relates, uh, you know, uh, objects called tensors to each other. But qualitatively, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's saying something simple. Uh, the objects in red over here uh, have to do with uh, local space-time curvature, how, how space and time geometry curve. The highlighted, uh, the blue object over here has to do with how matter and energy are distributed around. So um, I believe this, this quote is uh, sort of attributed to John Wheeler. Uh, and uh, one way to interpret this equation is that matter tells space-time how to curve, right? The, the matter distribution uh, is, uh, determines what the curvature looks like on the other side. And then uh, through additional equations of motion for matter motion, space-time geometry also dictates how matter moves, right? So there's the picture. Uh, I want to uh, uh, kind of demystify this a little bit over the next couple of slides, right? When I say uh, space-time geometry, I do mean some things, uh, some things that you normally associate with geometry, right? Length, angles, areas, volumes um, are associated with geometry of space. And then if you've ever drawn a you know, position versus time graph, you've done a little bit of space-time geometry, uh, right? So you, in addition, you add time intervals, uh, angles on, the, on a position versus time graph correspond with, with speeds. And then there are, of course, some, some slightly more generalized objects. Uh, you, know, you can have areas that involve time and so on. And so you, get, you do get some funky things there too, a little bit. Um, and uh, right, so and also those things can curve, right? What, what does curved regular geometry uh, mean? Well, you, some of the postulates of Euclidean geometry that, that you've used will no longer hold if your geometry is curved. So for example, you could have two shortest, well, uh, two or more shortest paths between a pair of points in curved space. The angles of a triangle might not add up to 180 degrees. The, the ratio of the circumference to the radius of a circle might not be two pi uh, and so on, right? Pi, is it two pi? Uh, some, somewhere there, some, somewhere there, it's something like three, all right. So uh, in, in, in practice, uh, right, on, on the scale of solar system, uh, these uh, effects are small. Uh, even though they're small, they are measurable and they're 
kind of intuitively dramatic, right? So uh, bending space, one, one way it, it, manif it manifests itself is that uh, a light ray passing by a, a massive object, so for example, the sun uh, will, will bend its path. So the yellow here represents the actual path the bent light takes. And then uh, the, the gray line here is extrapolated to where it appears that the light came from, right? If we assume it came from a straight line, we look at it and we say, ah, the light came from somewhere over here, whereas the light ray actually bent. So visually, it would seem that uh, when, when you're looking at something uh, next to the sun, the object shifts in the sky a little bit. Now, the, the effect is really, really, really tiny. For, for the sun, uh, you get uh, the deflection of this angle is super exaggerated. Yeah, the, this, the actual angle, if I drew it, you wouldn't see it. It's uh, uh, about 1 3,600 3, of, of one degree, some, some, somewhere on the order of an arc second uh, of, of, of the angle. Uh, it is, you know, you wouldn't notice it with the naked eye, but it can be measured precisely. It is there. Um, the, another sort of well-known uh, time-bending effect is that if you are closer to a massive object, the time runs a little bit more slowly. Um, if you're farther away, it runs a little bit faster. And, uh, you know, on, on, on Earth, we have a lot of very precise clocks. Some of them we've sent into space. And this effect, uh, is, even though it's small, is, is measurable and, and actually important in some uh, applications. So, for example, uh, the, the clocks on the GPS positioning satellites uh, run around uh, 40 microseconds slower than the, the sorry, the other way around, uh, the, uh, the clock on, on, uh, on Earth's surface uh, runs uh, around 40 microseconds uh, slower than a GPS clock per day. So that's on, you accumulate, so the GPS clock accumulates extra 40 microseconds uh, to us over, over one day. That's not a huge amount of time, but it's a very visible uh, amount of time for an atomic clock. And it's actually uh, a very disruptive amount of disynchronization if, you're, if you want to pinpoint your position on Earth very precisely. I think it leads to uh, discrepancy on the order of kilometers, which, you know, if you're in a city, uh, is a big deal. You're, you end up on a completely different part of it, right? So um, uh, gravity uh, today is, is a theory of space and time geometry. Um, now. The, the tension comes because the gravitating stuff uh, is made up of uh, atoms uh, and, and, and smaller things, right? So general relativity uh, equations deal with bulk matter. Uh, so what, what you write there, the, the, the various tensorial objects, you write assuming that uh, matter behaves as it does sort of on every on everyday scale, like solids and liquids and so on. But of course, solids and liquids consist of smaller bits uh, smaller bits consist of even smaller bits. And then at some point, you get to uh, atomic scale and subatomic uh, particles. And uh, the, the gravitational effect of the bulk should, of course, come from uh, the cumulative effect, right? Each little bit gravitates, and that, that should all add up to the, 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 the gravitational deflection of some, uh, that, that's created by the sun or the time uh, uh, dilation. Uh, time dilation that's created by Earth. Now, Earth is made of protons, electrons, neutrons. So presumably each one of them contributes to, to this thing a little bit. Uh, now, uh, once you get to that scale, however, you have to treat matter using some, some type of quantum theory, right? Quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, what, 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 whatever you have. And uh, quantum theory has some pretty striking features that don't, uh, that, that are not good friends with, with gravity, let's put it that way. Uh, so let me try to describe a couple of those, all right? One, one thing that happens in every quantum theory is the distinction between uh, state and measurement, right? So if you wanna learn something about any system, you measure things, right? You, you, you wanna learn something about a friend, you ask uh, what their name is. Well, they're not a friend yet, I guess, if you don't know their name. A person, you ask their name, where they're from, how old they are. These are measurements. You're, you're asking, you're getting an answer, and then you're keeping a ledger, right? You're writing all those things down for some reason. Uh, well, maybe, maybe in your mind, you just you have a good memory. So uh, roughly speaking, the, the, the ledger that you have as a state is your description of the state of that person, and the questions that you're asking are measurements. All right, and so uh, typically we think of, you know, you, you, you perform an exhaustive set of measurements and you know all there is to know about a system. 
And, uh, and, and that's, that's your complete description of the state. In quantum mechanics, so uh, uh, backtrack, in, 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 in ordinary life, you would think that if you know everything there is to know about a system, you can predict the outcome of any uh, future measurement that you make on it. Um, however, in quantum mechanics, that is manifestly not true. If you have the most complete information uh, in, in quantum theory, uh, there is always measurements to which you only know the probabilities of their outcomes. You don't know for sure what's going to happen. And it's not a question of performing more measurements. Performing more measurements doesn't actually help you. Okay, um, you, yeah, so it, uh, the second thing that, that's, that's pretty odd, and there's, there's more things that odd, I'm not just being, uh, being very, very selective, uh, is that if, you, if your quantum system can be in one state or, and then uh, you know a second state that it could be in, actually you can so superimpose those states, you can combine them in, in a variety of ways to get a whole bunch of other things that are also valid states. So, let me try and illustrate this with a completely made up system I'm going to call quantum lunch, <laughs> right? So if you're not a physicist, uh, this, this is all jargon mumbo jumbo. Let's, let's hope that this, this won't be, right? So uh, imagine that the cafeteria in the center building began offering something called quantum lunch. So uh, it's a quantum system. I get to make the rules for how it works. There are, uh, it consists of, uh, there's three measurements that you can form, perform on it. It consists of a drink, a main dish, and a side, right? You can measure what's for drink, uh, and it's either tea or juice. Um, I have very appetizing options here. You can measure the main dish. It's either tofu or chicken, uh, cooked somehow, uh, presumably, and then the side dish is soup or salad. And now, uh, the, the, rule of, the rules of these, this particular made-up quantum system is that uh, you, uh, the, the state is of, of it is completely specified by specifying either the drink or the main dish or the side. So if, you, if you've measured the, the drink of it as being tea, that's it. You don't need to measure anything else. In principle, that's, that's your complete information about the system. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, a, a, a state of, of tea gives you 50-50% uh, gives you chance of uh, measurement of main dish yielding tofu or chicken. And this is, this is a fundamental, this is how, uh, you know, quantum systems work, right? It, it doesn't uh, make a huge amount of sense for, for lunch, obviously, uh, but um, uh, really, so this, this quantum lunch is described by a single piece of it, uh, by, by only any one of those three measurements, right? So uh, supposing uh, you want to eat uh, tofu, Right, so you go to the machine and you just want to make sure that you set it in the, you know, that that your uh, lunch, quantum lunch, is prepared in a definite state of main dish, and that that state is tofu. Uh, you go there and you uh, get confused because you notice that um, the machine only allows you to pick uh, tea or juice as states. Okay. So bear with me. So this is this is terribly confusing, but fortunately there is a physicist behind you in line, and 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 he says. Well, you can combine tea and juice states to get other states, okay? And so uh, if you want tofu, you just order tea plus juice. If you want uh, chicken, you order tea minus juice, all right? <laughs> and this is, uh, this, is stretching the, uh, the, th this is stretching the example a little bit, but here, bear with me. So you say, how do I get salad? And, and, and the friend says, aha, this is where uh, imaginary numbers come, come in. See that I button on the screen? Uh, that's that's the imaginary unit, the square root of negative one, right? If you if you want salad, you have to order t minus i times juice. Then then you'll definitely get salad. Uh, the the the, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that uh, uh, quantum systems have sort of mutually ex exclusive measurements that, on on the face of it, you wouldn't think of as mutually exclusive if you if the system were big and large, right? There's there's no reason for you to uh, not be able to tell whether there is tea and to sorry tofu in your lunch, and the other thing is that uh, they the the states can be superimposed, and these superpositions can be can actually be measured, right? So if your uh, quantum lunch is in the superposition of tea plus i times juice, uh, actually you can check that that's the case by measuring uh, the side dish, and you'll get soup, and that 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 sort of uh, that that corresponds to the superimposed state, okay? 
So this, I'm sure this makes only a very limited amount of sense to, to anyone who's not a physicist. The physicist may, may have noticed that, that I've used uh, the, the components of a spin half system to, to make up my uh, quantum lunch. Uh, there, there are other systems that are uh, you know, sort of more, more well-known and that, that, that are real uh, that, that behave in a very quantum mechanical way. So let me uh, talk about one of those, uh, electron and a hydrogen atom. Uh, and uh, a hydrogen atom consists of a single proton uh, and uh, uh, a, a single proton nucleus uh, and a, a single bound electron. And when I first learned about that, I had a picture that, that was kind of like this, that there is uh, a heavy nucleus and a uh, lonely electron orbiting it, uh, a little bit like a planet going around uh, a star. Uh, but that picture is uh, wrong uh, because uh, an electron orbiting a proton would do two things. Uh, for, first, it would have a uh, continuous set of values for energy because there's no reason this orbit cannot be a little bit smaller or a little bit larger. There is, there's no limitation on what kind of orbit it can have. And each one would have a slightly different value of energy. So it would have all sorts of possible energies that, that, uh, that it would have. And second, it would actually be completely unstable because uh, going around an electron uh, being a charged particle would actually emit um, uh, emit radiation, electromagnetic radiation, lose energy and spiral into uh, the nucleus. So the best you can do if you wanted to spatially represent what uh, an electron is doing in a, in a, uh, in a hydrogen atom is to uh, plot, um, uh, wanna plot the uh, energy orbitals, right? So if you, if you have done chemistry uh, or physics, you will perhaps seen a picture a little bit like this. Um, uh, these display uh, the uh, uh, different, uh, th these are spatial plots of different energy states of the electron, different uh, orbitals, right? The, the, the word was changed from the word orbit just to, uh, just to make them slightly different, not to imply this, this picture. Um, this, each state corresponds to a specific definite energy. Uh, and uh, actually also angular momentum, but I'll, I'll, I, I won't focus on that. Um, and what you're looking at is, is a heat map. The brighter spots are the places where the electron is more likely to be found. The dark spots are where it's almost impossible to find it. Uh, each row corresponds to a single value of energy, right? So this is, this is what the, how the electron is distributed in its lowest energy state, the nucleus is in the middle. It's pretty close to it. Uh, first excited state, second excited state, third excited state. Um, one thing to note is that generally, when, uh, so these states are states of definite energy. When you know energy of an electron that's bound to a hydrogen atom, you don't actually know exactly where it is around it, right? So if you look at this orbital, is it over here? Is it over here, over here, over here? It's probably not over there because it's pretty dark, but, but you could find it anywhere where there is uh, some, some probability of finding it, some, right? Some, anywhere there is some red or orange. Uh, so uh, location and, uh, of the electron and energy that it has are kind of like uh, the, uh, let's say, the side dish and the, and the drink in the quantum lunch. You cannot specify both of those things simultaneously. Uh, the, so this, uh, this, this is uh, relevant, um, right? Uh, in, in that uh, as a state of definite energy of a bound uh, uh, hydrogen uh, atom is a state of uh, superposition of, of you know, of, of various positions. It could be here, 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 if we look at this state, for example. Uh, and so the question for uh, trying to, say, write Einstein's equation for, for an electron uh, to, to see how it curves space-time is where exactly is it going to be curving space-time? If it's, if it's distributed like this, is it curving space-time over here? Is it doing it over here, over here, over here? Uh, is it, uh, you know, is it, is it some combination of those? And uh, general relativity really isn't equipped to, to handle this fuzziness. Uh, this is not just a problem for, uh, for gravity. This is a problem for any field theory, uh, right? Except all of the other field theories have quantum versions of it. So in order to deal with this fuzziness of, of particles that interact with fields, all of the fields have been quantized, uh, except gravity. And so it seems like uh, this is also what you might need to do with gravity in order to make sense of how uh, bulk, uh, how bulk matter gravitates if it consists of, of these small bits. And uh, 
So sort of a quick, uh, quick uh, shout out to the uh, you know, quantum machines unit. They're uh, working on uh, ways to superimpose much larger things than, than an electron to put them into uh, a spatial superposition where the combination of them being like here and here. All right, so if you want to know more about the work on that, talk to them. Um, so the, the, the problems in uh, uh, getting gravity and quantum theory to play nice with each other, they, they kind of cut both ways. Uh, quantum theory is actually also not very accommodating of some of the features of gravity. And uh, one, of, one of the big reasons is that all successful quantum theories uh, that, that, that we have, you know, quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, uh, they use space and time as uh, in some uh, uh, form as background structures, right? So here is, here is all of quantum physics and it sits on those pillars of space and time. There's three spatial dimensions, that's probably the time. Uh, and then you find out but that, that uh, those are not solid. You have to incorporate them into your theory. Not only can these elephants move, but they also move in response to what's happening on, on the thing that they're carrying. Um, Right, so just uh, sort of a quick example of, of Schrodinger equation, uh, right? It gives you the rate of change of uh, wave function uh, in, in, in response to how it's distributed in space. And uh, of course, to talk about rate of change of something or how something is distributed in space, you need a notion of space and, and time geometries. And uh, right, the, uh, all, all of the other quantum theories have, have, uh, have, have objects like that in their formulation. Um, incidentally, this, this picture also uh, uh, is, a, is a good place to uh, point out why there are so many approaches to quantum gravity. So once you let the elephants move, uh, what are you going to hold fixed? Are, you gonna, are they standing on something? Is there a tortoise? Uh, does the tortoise move? Is it sitting on something or are the tortoise is all the way down? So what, what are you going to uh, allow uh, to not be fixed in your theory? Uh, it, it, is, is, it becomes a, you know, a basic question. So uh, I kind of see the, the, the work of uh, trying to bring the, the two descriptions, of, the two fundamental descriptions of stuff in our cosmos together as sort of a giant puzzle. For the moment, uh, it contains mostly theoretical pieces. So what, what I described to you is a, is a theoretical tension. It's not really very practical in that. You don't really usually need to compute something like time dilation created by a hydrogen atom or, or so, anything like that. It wouldn't really be measurable. Uh, so um, the, uh, and, and you know, the, the trouble with that is that you, know, you don't really know where, where, where to start. Do you, uh, do you work with, with the gravity, make it more quantum? Do we want to work with quantum physics, make, make it more gravitational? Do you try and create sort of a giant framework where all of them will fit and then, and then some? And so my particular uh, side of this puzzle is I uh, research ways of so, uh, trying to do quantum physics without referencing external time and space with the view of also making, uh, making those things dynamical like they are in, uh, in general relativity. Um, I'm going to take a sip and then uh, say a few more words about that. So I will try to be uh, compact and not take too much of your time beyond this point. Uh, so how do I how do I do stuff? Uh, so let's let's uh, here's an example of a, you know, a, a textbook physics problem. Right, and then the idea here is to you know force a student to figure out where this car is going to land, given how it uh, went off a cliff. Um, there's lots of problems like that. Nothing very special about this one. I do want to point out that right, this problem includes uh, uh, things uh, which which need to be uh, which which are external to the problem. It involves. It includes uh, reference to, to space, time, velocity, things like that, that require um, experimental apparata to, uh, to measure that are not part of the problem itself, right? The problem doesn't involve rulers or clocks. Well, and uh, if you take uh, you know, an undergraduate degree in physics, uh, in, you know, all the courses do that at all levels, but uh, you probably won't spend a lot of time talking about uh, what 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 clocks and, and and rulers are, what they do, um, and the reason is uh, because there are uh, 
uh, very many different good clocks that all agree with each other. So you probably know what, what this clock and that clock are, right? One dot wind up clock, pendulum clock. This is an atomic clock, uh, right? Uh, I think an atomic cesium clock, the one that's used for um, definition of uh, SI unit of second. Uh, this is a biological clock of, of my three-year-old son and the day after we came, uh, arrived to Okinawa. There are processes in his body that tell him that despite you know, the light of day, that it is time to sleep and, uh, and he falls asleep. So clocks uh, are not necessarily things uh, dedicated to timekeeping, but any processes that, that uh, uh, take a predictable amount of time so that, that all synchronize with each other, right? So Earth rotating a certain amount of uh, times around its axis as the sun goes, uh, sorry, as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, you know, uh, human body going through certain biological processes and so on. Um, so uh, when, when you ask what uh, exactly the clock measures, there are sort of two uh, e extreme uh, views. One is that uh, it's measuring, there is, there is such a thing as a flow of time. And then you, uh, you, the clock is kind of a flow meter. You immerse it in the flow of time. And then the time flows and then makes changes to the clock in a way. And then you, you read off the flow of time, right? So this is a flow meter in a river. Um, the, on the other side, uh, there is uh, the view that clocks uh, track relations between events, right? And, you know, actually most of our timekeeping, uh, at least in the long run, involves uh, things like that, right? So, for example, when I arrived to Okinawa, the sign was aligned with Aries uh, constellation. I'm not promoting uh, hor horoscopes and astrology, just just using it as an example. And now the, the sun is aligned uh, with the Taurus constellation. So, so there is, uh, you know, there's, there's this uh, um, uh, change of uh, relations between the sun and earth that, that's happening at the same time as something's happening, uh, you know, uh, in my life. Uh, and then similar argument can go for uh, space and rulers. Do they measure something that's actually there or do they measure relations uh, between objects. These two views are not exactly uh, mutually exclusive unless you take very extreme versions of them. Uh, you, you can sort of work with combinations of the two. Uh, normally, we adopt, uh, unconsciously adopt this view because it's much less clunky, uh, right? So if we are trying to solve this problem, we're just saying that laws of physics tell us how a car moves over time. If we're uh, taking sort of a, a relational view, we need to include the time and space uh, references in our uh, description of physical laws, we, we'd say something that's that sounds a little awkward. Something like "car's location reference is correlated," you know, is correlated with some uh, uh, reference timekeeping device here. Uh, now, this is clunky, but actually, it is productive. Uh, it is a productive view uh, if you want to uh, internalize time and and sort of. Uh, suck it into your quantum theory and, and make it an, a, an, an inside internal object. Um, so let me uh, use a, uh, a, a very briefly use the simplest example of a relational model that I can, that I know of, uh, right? So a, uh, imagine a one dimensional universe that uh, one dimension, one space dimension, right? There's also time. So this is a, an example of spatial relationality. So I'm not actually going to worry about time. There's the river of time and, and that's, that's that over here. Now, um, there, there are these three point like objects, which I will call particles, because, not because they're uh, protons or neutrons or something like that, but because they, they have no shape, they, they're, they're all just take exactly a, a point in space. Uh, and if I want, the only thing they can do is move around uh, back and forth along this one line. And so the, the state of them, uh, the, the configuration of them is completely described if I uh, say where they are uh, and, uh, you know, what, what their state of uh, motion is. Um, so I'll use XA to label where A is from the origin, how far it is, XB to label where B is from the origin, XC how far C is from the origin. Since the origin is completely arbitrary, this universe has no special uh, features aside from those three objects. Uh, there is an arbitrariness in, in the description of, uh, of where those things uh, are. And the sort of undergraduate textbook approach for uh, analyzing a problem like that would probably be to fix the origin somewhere um, and then worry about it later. 
you would you fix it somewhere, you solve for what uh, the, dis, the, the, the position of A is relative to the origin B and C as functions of time. Uh, and uh, the way in which the arbitrariness of the origin comes in is that uh, there are going to be uh, equivalent solutions uh, that, that only differ by where you place the origin. Uh, if you want to make this uh, system explicitly uh, relational, uh, there's, there's a thing you can do if you uh, formulate this uh, in the language of Hamiltonian mechanics. I'm, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, the way to do it is to impose a constraint on the total momentum of uh, these uh, particles. Uh, and uh, fun things happen when you do that. Uh, when you, when you uh, analyze the, this system this way and you try to solve this, you do not get a definite solution for where this is as a function of time, where that is as a function of time, or where that is as a function of time relative to the origin. Instead, you get uh, definite solutions for the relations, uh, only for uh, where uh, this object is in relation to that one, where that object is in relation to this one, right? Uh, and there is a quantum analog of that uh, analyzed extensively by uh, the, the chair here. Um, so you, you can uh, do the same thing in the quantum version of the system. You can impose the constraint. And again, fun things happen. Uh, basically, when you solve the constra this uh, constraint quantum system, you can no longer assign probabilities for where A, B, or C are individually, but only for a relational data, only for where C or B are, say, from the perspective of A, or where B is from the perspective of C, and so on and so forth. Um, time relations can, can conceptually and, 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 and technically be treated in the same way. Uh, so uh, if you want to know how some system, instead of uh, looking at some system and how it changes over time, you combine it with some reference system and see how, uh, how different states of this system relate to different state of the other system. And so you have some kind of a history of uh, co-evolution of one system and the other. Now, this, this is just a pretty picture. I'm not trying to imply that my models involve complex biological systems. Uh, so this, uh, my, my models still are a, a lot more like the, the particles that you saw on the other slide. This is, this is just a, a little bit more pleasant to look at. Uh, you can see why temporal uh, relations might be more complicated because to uh, sort of to, to run along the time is, is a little bit more involved than to just shift the origin back and forth. That's, that's a very simple operation uh, to see what happens at a later time. You actually have to evolve both things and that, that, uh, that, that is equivalent to solving dynamics. Um, uh, nevertheless, the, the, the sort of these, these systems can be set up the same way. Uh, constraints give you um, some of the same magical results, uh, but there are definitely technical issues. Um, and, um, you know, we just want to say, right, there's, there's lots of interesting problems uh, to solve. And uh, I want to uh, give kudos to uh, the, the qubits and time unit for uh, sort of combining uh, the work uh, the, in relation to observables in quantum gravity with, with the work uh, that's done in uh, quantum information, because I think that, that has definitely led to some new and interesting ideas. And then I want to end on a lighter note to see if anyone is still awake. So I took the liberty of adjusting uh, the, the comic to local geography. And, and it, yeah, here you go. So in, in the US where this comic originates, it's, it's common to think of Australians as walking upside down. Whereas really, if you're over here, Australians do are no longer upside down. The Brazilians are. All right, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks very much for the nice talk. Are there any questions? No questions at all. You have a question? Yeah. 
Thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. Uh, I come from neuroscience, so I know very little about physics, but I have delved into a bit about the concepts of string theory. The things you're studying, what are your opinions in relativity to string theory and the fields that you can measure this, these parameters in? Um, so I, I am not in string theory. So string, string theory, I guess, was, is uh, like I would term it more so if, you like, if we do the puzzle analogy here, right? The string theory, so if, 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 you, if you have like gravity over here and matter over here, string theory really is uh, trying to, uh, you know, find a unified theory of all of them at once. Uh, as opposed to, say, uh, attempts to quantize gravity on its own and not necessarily have a, like a unified theory of gravity and matter, but at least one where they, the two can use the same language. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like my, my perspective on it. Um, there's, yeah, there's lots of other uh, efforts to, you know, bring the, the two theories together and, um, there's, uh, they all suffer from a different set of technical issues, but I, I do believe that sort of, uh, that, that kind of, ah, that, that, that this problem, um, kind of the problem of uh, incorporating life uh, geometry is, is a problem in, in all of them in some way, shape or form. Yeah, uh, Nick. Hi, uh, so. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it's a bit of an open-ended question, okay. but are there any uh, toy models or laboratory experiments you, you could use to explore these ideas? Um, so there's, the, yeah, the toy models that, that I work with tend, tend to be uh, picked not for uh, necessarily their realizability as, as tabletop experiments, uh, but, but for kind of the, um, you know, the uh, theoretical features that they have, right? They they resemble gravity in some way, or uh, and uh, they're you know you can solve them on a piece of paper without uh, use of heavy computing. So off the top of my head, um, not not at the moment. Um, uh, so, uh, but I think on the quantum information side, uh, people are interested in um, uh, quantum reference frames in in terms of. Um, uh, you know, things that you can experimentally explore with them. And Philip might actually uh, know more about yeah. that. Yeah, so actually this relational notion of time, there has been one experiment that people have carried out. So we use something like quantum clocks and we define a relational notion of time through correlations or entanglements of a clock in a system. Um, so that has um, been... Philip, is that mic on? Because for Zoom, it will matter. It is on, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so there's been a, a, an experiment about 10 years ago um, on realizing, you know, a theoretical um, framework or um, a description of, of time evolution through entanglement of, of a quantum clock with uh, something else. Um, that's in terms of this relational no, uh, notion of time, I think the only experiment that I'm explicitly aware of. Now, this idea of quantum reference frames, um, that's something that uh, has been realized to some degree in, in experiments, but um, not so much to stand in as, as um, relations for space and time. But quantum reference frames are something much more general. And uh, for instance, there are um, instances in quantum optics where that turns out to be relevant, um, where basically but the quantum reference frame stands in for something else that has a somewhat more abstract meaning in that case. It's something that's is associated with a gauge group such as in, in Maxwell's here. So, um, and uh, basically you then define what you mean by light and matter relative to, um, to a choice of quantum reference frame. And so they do appear in, in even certain quantum optics experiments. But yeah, in terms of, of references for time and space, it's still something that, um, you know, it's much more difficult to realize uh, in an experiment. Um, um, but mathematically, the framework is, is the same for, for treating these quantum reference frames that act as references for space and time as those, for instance, for, for quantum electrodynamics. Yeah. Um, 
So first, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have a question about, uh, I would like to have your opinion about, you know, Einstein equations makes the links between matter and, and space time, right? Okay. But if matter is quantum, mm -hmm. see, the right hand side has to be quantum or classical according to you of oh, the equations. Um, so, so yeah, you have T menu that describe matter. Right, right. Matter is right. quantum. What about um, the left-hand side? So, uh, I mean, you, you can't really write it with like, you know, yeah, quantum side on one side and, yeah. and uh, classical side on the other side and, and make complete sense of that. Yeah. So, so they probably both need to be uh, quantum. Yeah, that's... Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, some people are trying to, for example, to um, make semi-classical approximation, like the Diozzi Penrose model. I don't know if you heard about it. You have matter is quantum, okay. but you assume that space time is classical, so you can derive a kind of uh, Schrodinger equations with gravity. And so, uh, I don't know if you heard about it. So some people try to quantize gravity, but up to now we didn't yeah. succeed. Yeah. Uh, so so there's there's definitely uh, some like intermediate stages where where you um, uh, treat matter as uh, you know semi classical, uh, right? The, like the Right. The, the first one, one thing you, you know, yeah, there's lots of things you can do. One thing you can do is you, you make a, a geometry dynamical, but, but not coupled to matter. And so that's, that's really cheating, right? You have quantum field theory on curve space time. Uh, you could uh, uh, derive semi-classical corrections to classical variables, and then you can jam them in those equations. But, but then when, you know, uh, Right, like, uh, and, and and so yeah, so the uh, these these could be useful, uh, absolutely, um, but but they're not sort of a full, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> right? Not 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 the complete deal. Let's say, um, mm. does that make sense? Yeah, it does. thank you very much. Any further question? That's not the case. Then let's thank Arthur again. Nice talk. Thank you. And if you do come up with another question, so he's here until August, so you can bug him. <laughs> so thanks for.